Um, I'm Tamara Brunel with the City of Edmonton. I'm the Master Composter Recycler Volunteer Coordinator and I'm presenting how to compost at home and we also have Rodney who is waving there. He is the Master Composter Recycler Program Coordinator. He also oversees home composting programs and basically we're two of a three um, person team and we're kind of just all um, getting to do all these presentations and it's a really fun and, and uh, exciting way to meet new people and get out some information. Hey, Tamara. Yes. What do you call a short cow in tall grass? Mm. Utterly Regular. tickled. <laughs> all right. I see Rodney talking, but he's muted. Once again, the most riveting things shared with everyone while I'm on mute. Um, I was going to share, Tamara, that uh, before we get going, if for some reason some of the participants happen to think of a brilliant question outside of this session, I will post now an email address or a phone number that you can call the city at almost any time, and we will answer you, wait, wait, Probably not at 2 a.m., your compost emergency, but, but in a reasonable amount of time, we will respond. So I'll post that here and uh, you can take it from there, Tamara. Mm -hmm. What is composting? The question we're all trying to ask or answer while we're here. So what we're trying to do in our yard is something that happens naturally. And also it doesn't have to be a yard. We'll get to that later. We are just trying to control the results. Control decomposition is basically what composting is. So organic waste decomposes naturally with the help of microorganisms, water, and air. And the final product of, of which is compost is called humus. Humus is carbon from living things that has decayed into its stable form. It carries nutrients to plant available form, which it releases slowly or quickly depending on ambient temperature. So microorganisms would include bacteria, fungi, um, amoeba, mites, yeast, etc. They do most of the work, but throughout the life cycle of a compost pile, other bugs will appear as well. So why compost at home? There's lots of reasons why you should compost or you can compost at home. You can um, fertilize your plants. You can reduce your household waste. Organic waste can make up approximately 40 to 60 percent of your garbage. And it takes a lot of energy and resources for trucks to haul our organics. So organics would be like your kitchen scraps, anything you've peeled a carrot, that kind of thing. Um, gas to heat the buildings and coal to power the lights and machinery. So organics are, as I said, peels, cores to newspaper and napkins. They're full of nutrients. In the landfill, these nutrients go to waste. They also emit methane gas when they decompose in landfill conditions. So there's very little oxygen, everything's kind of on top of each other. So when you're composting at home, it also serves as a great education tool for kids, neighbors, and it creates more responsibility and ownership of your environmental impact. Um, other benefits, uh, repair your soil, build your soil, um, which would offer higher yield in vegetables or herbs or even maybe even bigger flowers. So compost is great for your soil. Adding compost to soil improves soil's water holding capacity and porosity, reduces erosion, improves micro microbiological activity and biodiversity in soil. So when roots from plants penetrate deeply into loose soil, carbon in soil holds three times its weight and moisture. Soil can blow away, blow or wash away a hundred times faster than nature builds it. The life in the soil feeds and protects your plants. So porosity is directly dependent on the initial water content, temperature, pressure, relative humidity, air velocity, electromagnetic radiation, food material size, competition, composition, and initial microstructure and viscoelastic properties of the biomaterial. We talk a lot about science of composting because it helps 
create building blocks for understanding deeper. Oh, is it, it's not just throwing stuff in a bin. And like, I mean, it can be, if that's all you want it to be, it can be, but if you know more about it, you might be more interested in it or um, understand sharing that even with neighbors or really feel connected to the, the project that you're doing. So soil building is so important, um, even in potted plants. Um, you want your soil to have enough nutrients in it so your plants grow big or they produce a lot of peas or beans or whatever you're growing. And you also don't have to spend money on fertilizer either. So we always say if you've seen one compost, you've just seen one compost. A compost system doesn't have to look a certain way. It can look a lot of different ways and people always have different methods and they have to find what works for them. So if you're, when you're doing something, it has to work for you in order for it to be sustainable. So in our climate, it's easy to compost from spring to fall. Compost bins often freeze during the winter, but it's possible to keep the process going. It'll be slower, but you could keep it going. I know my parents, they're super proud of their um, home compost system. And my dad just meticulously layers food scraps and leaves even through the winter and it turns into this like giant compost popsicle and then the, in the spring it just melts and he's just so proud of it. Um, you do not have to be as meticulous as he is. You just chuck it all in and, and over the winter and it'll just freeze anyways and then add some browns when it starts to thaw, give it some air and, and it'll, it'll go pretty quickly because freezing helps break it down as well. So there's different kinds of composting. You can compost in your backyard like shown in the picture. Um, you can use a bin, you can just use a pile. Um, I've even heard of people using like a, a big pail or an ice cream pail, depends on how much you want to compost. There's bokashi, there's no oxygen, and that's kind of like a fermenting process. And that's just a whole nother workshop. And I would need Mark to do that. He's our, our compost doctor. And yeah, you'd have to go down to compost school actually and, and talk to him about that. There's also vermicomposting. So that's when you use worms to compost. And that's really popular um, in households. Uh, I hear a lot in apartments or sometimes kids just wanna take control of it. It's really, really easy. Sometimes the yuck factor is too much with, with worms, but that's why you have to find what fits for you. Um, there's all different styles of bins. Like I said, you have a pile, you can have a tumbler, you can have a, a black bin like an earth machine or the rectangle ones you have a three bin system where you build them out of uh, reclaimed pallets. There's, there's so many different ways and no one way is the right way. You might see a commercial that says, buy this bin, it's the best, it's $300. No, you could do it for free. You can make yourself something or like I said, use a pile. Um, cost doesn't have to be a barrier in terms of a bin. So with composting, the recipe is always greens, browns, water, and air. If you've seen one compost system or one compost bin, you've seen exactly one compost system. And what works for, say, Cassidy, or what works for Tamara, fits for Cassidy and Tamara, but might not fit for me. Um, also, no two people have exactly the same kind of food scraps or uh, grass or leaves or trimmings that they're going to be putting in, since that changes um, per individual, it's very life, uh, about your lifestyle, but actually it's not just about that. It might be how, um, as Cassidy started composting today, her composting style might have to change, say 10 years from now as her life changes. So it's very dynamic. The great thing is, is that there's no, as Tamara said, there's no wrong way to compost with one exception. As long as the composting, as long as the people composting involve four things, everything else can be figured out and that's greens, broad, browns, water and air. So I want to make a point. If you have not already written down greens, browns, water, air, the only two things we would like you to leave from tonight's chat is greens, browns, water, air and edmonton.ca slash compost. Take it from there, Tamara. Awesome. So greens and browns are the input and for begin beginners that means anything from a plant. Your carrot peelings, your banana peels, your celery ends, you had half a bag of grapes accidentally go bad, that would work. Um, napkins and paper towel work. Um, even leftover salad, you didn't finish your salad, there's a little bit of dressing on there, don't worry about it. Um, 
but you don't want to add a lot. Of, you don't want oils and meats and, and dairy in there. But if it's a tiny bit, that's not going to be the end of the world. Um, so the carbon to nitrogen ratio is dynamic. It's always changing. So when you add more greens, those would be nitrogens and you need to balance them out with carbons, which would be browns. So if you add greens, you should add some browns as well. So paper towel would be considered a brown. Um, other examples of browns are dry leaves or um, even egg cartons. The paper egg cartons would work. I've put those in mine. Um, paper towels, I said, sometimes newspaper. Um, yeah, so water and air is what make it work. The enzymes and acids need to be moist to work. And that bacteria and fungi need oxygen to function. And too much oxygen removes um, with the layer of moisture on the surface of the material plus combines with carbon to form CO2. So greens and browns differ based on the amount of nitrogen contained in materials. Greens are fresh and juicy, browns are old and woody. And you want to manually add water with hose or rainwater or watering can, or even just you see it starting to rain, open your bin and let it rain on it, or even collecting your dishwater. Greens are also rich in water. So if you add a lot of, let's say, watermelon rinds and, and carrot tops, you might not need to add as much um, water to that because those will break down and, and have water too. And air, you want to fluff your pile regularly to release carbon dioxide and allow oxygen to enter. Um, some bins have built-in holes or slats to feed, or you could feed a hollow pipe with holes through it. There's all kinds of videos on YouTube on how to do that. Most modest compost systems don't need that. But when we did pumpkin smash, where we smashed over 500 pumpkins at compost school, we had two huge piles and Mark ended up burying and Rodney buried um, PVC pipe with holes in it so that um, air could get inside. So it just didn't go stinky on us. Um, and, and it's also an example of composting too much of one thing. We had to add a lot of browns. There wasn't a lot of diversity in materials um, and it might get a little stinky, but I assume that most households aren't composting 500 pumpkins, but you could compost your pumpkin from Halloween. So what can you compost? As I said, everything from a plant will compost easily Animal products will become unpleasant. Um, if you're experienced, you could go there and you could call Mark and um, or even email compost at edmonton.ca and ask on how to do that. But for now, anything from plants. Um, so once you get really, really good at it and you're confident and you're producing good compost, your compost doesn't smell. So it should smell kind of like a forest floor kind of thing. And, it, it might smell a little bit like celery or carrots while it's going, but it shouldn't stink. It shouldn't smell like dead animals, I guess. Um, <laughs> so you want to avoid meat, fish, bones, dairy, oily foods, um, pet waste or litter. So if you're wanting to learn more about those things, whole other session, Mark can definitely help out with that. Um, but things that are good to go on these slides, really easy. Just collect them in a bowl or a kitchen pail. Anything works. Um, ice cream pail. I should have grabbed my kitchen pail to show. I think Rodney's going to grab something. There you go. A container. Maybe you lost the lid to the container, or maybe you do have the lid to the container. Anything works. Um, so in diseased plants. So diseased plants sometimes need, well, they need special care. And there's other, there's probably a whole bunch of, we always get the question of, what about rhubarb leaves? Or... What about um, noxious weeds and that kind of thing? And sometimes there's provincial legislation on noxious weeds or weeds, but um, some studies suggest the way to fight disease is to inoculate the compost with the disease material and grow the microbes that will go on to fight the disease. Again, as a beginner, let's just, just stick to the basics and, and keep those out, but we can always provide more information if maybe you're not a beginner and you want to go ahead and do more. So um, Tamara, we had two excellent questions. Um, Laura asked about eggshells. Do you want to comment on eggshells? Sure, eggshells are great. Um, maybe just give them a squeeze with your hand. Um, things that are chopped up or in smaller pieces will definitely break down faster. Um, and they're good. You can even just crush eggshells and put them on top of your plants. 
So I commonly put eggshells into my compost and it works for me. Again, this is a great example of, is it from a plant? Hmm, not really. So uh, I am more comfortable with a whole range of uh, yuck and my experience with composting. Eggshells are a great example where um, there are great minerals in these eggshells, which can be added to your soil. And potentially if you're gardening, it's gonna be nutrients for your plants. Um, if you don't want eggshells in your, if you don't want to find little bits of eggshells in your garden, then maybe don't put eggshells in, but they are good for the soil. Um, if you're just starting out and you're a little bit squeamish about like, how is this going? Again, your rule of thumb is anything from a plant. Which brings us around to Roxanne's question about paper towels. Um, can they be wet? Should they have, it? what about food remains? Tamara, how would you answer that one? Um... Personally, I just kind of rip them up a little bit. I wouldn't throw like a big glob of paper towel in there. Um, if I had wiped up, let's say, spilt salad dressing or like, I don't know, a bunch of raw chicken and it's saturated with something stinky like that, I would just probably throw it in the garbage or I dig a hole and just put it in the garden. That's another way to do, we'll get to that. Um, but this leads to your sensibilities once again, clear. Um, I know my own thresholds for yuck. And I also know my, my capabilities in terms of composting. So I put all sorts of stuff in my compost. So yes, I put, uh, you know, if McDonald's gives me an extra paper towel and I don't want to keep it for reuse, I might put that in my compost bin. I put my snotty, snotty paper towels in. Um, so I, I'm quite comfortable with the range. Again, choose what fits you. Um, but the moisture, say your paper towel is moist, well, then you, everything that you add into your compost pile is going to add a little bit of moisture. Moist, moist paper towels are going to add a dose of moisture, maybe not a barrel of water, but they're going to add some of that. So you're always adding a little bit of browns and a little bit of water. Keep that in mind as you consider the greens, the balance of greens, browns, water, air. Um, Tamara, we also had a question about weeds. Um, uh, can I put them in my compost or will that perpetuate the weeds? So that again, depends on the type of weed, depends on what you're going to use the finished compost for, and also depends on the part of the weed. Like for example, seeds versus the body of the plant or like a prodigious root or a rooting weeds. Um, do you want to comment on that? Um, yeah, another so from personal experience, when we pull weeds out of our garden, we just pull them and then we put them on the garden and it's called chop and drop. We just leave it, it dries, and then we kind of just chop it up. Um, but things like we have horsetail weed in our garden and we pull it out and burn it because <laughs> it's everywhere. Um, so definitely types of weeds um, do matter. And that's where you want to check to provincial legislation. If for some reason you have a noxious weed growing on your property, Sometimes there are certain things you need to do with those weeds. You can't just put them back in your compost or just leave them. So um, it's probably edmonton.ca slash community standards might be the website for that or edmonton.ca slash weeds and there'll be that uh, legislation there. Um, but again, you can just try things too. You're starting out and you're thinking, I just want to put compost on my bedding plants, or I'm just gonna make compost to put it on my tomato plants this year. Just put something in your compost bin and try it and work it out. And but before you give up, promise us that you'll give us a call or an email because it, you can always fix it. Even if it goes anaerobic, meaning it's stinky. So in some areas, some people might be part of the green cart um, pilot. And because everything goes in there, um, sometimes when it's plus 35 out the one day a year that we have, um, <laughs> those bins can start to go anaerobic because there's meat in there. Um, so we want to prevent that. Um, so, but just try it. It's, you can't mess it up too, too bad. It's always fixable. This is a cute little graphic on what can I compost. Um, Mark did this graphic. He wrote Q-tips, and you don't want the Q-tips to be plastic banana on banana peels, grass, water, air, greens, browns, ice cream, uh, toenails, beets, cookies, you know, the whole gambit. 
Um, I put, I, I shave and I put my little, little chin hairs in there. Um, but again, that's what I'm comfortable with, Cassidy. I'm not going to tell you how to compost or what you're comfortable with. Because if you've seen one compost, you've seen exactly one compost. Um, which leads to kind of, uh, Tamara, do we have a slide coming up about browns or should we ask that now? Uh, I think we have a slide about browns. Okay, we'll come back to that, Brian. Mm -hmm. So you can compost these, but definitely use caution. We already kind of um, talk, talked a little bit about this. So weeds don't pull them until you have to. Sometimes weeds build, feed, and protect soil. So that horsetail I talked to, it actually has a really deep kind of like taproot system and it, it, it's somewhat helpful and it doesn't interfere with the carrots or whatever. It's just everywhere and it's annoying. So <laughs> we kind of try to get rid of it, but it's really hard. Um, so weeds can add valuable nitrogen and other nutrients to soil. Another example of a taproot is a dandelion. Dandelions are actually a flower and they can be helpful. They're also good for the bees. They're one of the first flowers out. Um, sawdust and wood shavings. Small quantities are okay. They can be slow to break down if not fully broken down. May pull nitrogen from the soil if there's too much of them. You wanna watch for treated lumber though, because it could leach toxic chemicals when they were created. So you wanna be careful with chemicals like herbicides and pesticides. Um, if you're using compost to um, fertilize your organic vegetable garden, you probably don't want to throw um, some grass clippings in there that you just sprayed with weed and feed that you might want to wait a few days until those kind of flush out. Um, or we have another solution to that in a little bit here. So um, for those kind of things, safer to use in flower beds and vegetable gardens. Rhubarb leaves, poinsettia, castor seeds, they contain toxins that break down quickly and are safe, but the really big leaves can gnat and inhibit airflow. So you want to just like chop them up with a, a garden tool. Um, grass clippings, they're, sorry, Roddy, go ahead. So uh, com your comment about, uh, uh, I'm not sure where you were going with grass clippings, but you mentioned rhubarb leaves. Um, we've heard often that uh, you go and uh, rhubarb leaves. Yes, they, those kinds of things have toxins. Here's a hint. Let's not make a full compost pile just with rhubarb. But I do put my rhubarb in. Tamara mentions that the issue about, say, rhubarb is not necessarily the components of the, the, the relatively manageable level of toxins in the plant itself, but just the matting effect. So again, thinking about those greens, browns, water, air, and how air is going to get in. And we also mentioned that about sawdust. If I put in a whole canister of uh, sawdust, that's going to add, and then I add water to it, I've just got glue. And so there's no air in that thing. So you're always thinking about greens, browns, water, air. How am I balancing my materials with the water and the air? And that leads nicely into grass clipping. So they can help your compost, but like a handful or two might be okay. Um, they also work good as mulch. If you've planted your carrots and it's going to be hot out, you can just put your grass clippings on top of the, near the carrots so it keeps the moisture in. Or better yet, leave your clippings on the lawn. So mow high, mow often. Is there another one? And go bagless, take the bag off your mow mower. Mow high, mow often, keep your bag off your mower. Um, and having those grass clippings will actually kind of uncompost, a term I think Rodney coined during our volunteer training. Um, I think he could take credit for that. Um, so it, it'll help build the soil of where your grass is and it'll prevent thatching. And it's often, it's some, you might've heard it as grass cycling. And it's super easy. It like cuts down the time to cut your lawn too. It's awesome. And it goes away in like, I don't know, three days. You probably won't even be able to find those clippings. Unless you've left those, unless your grass is like mine and it's like this tall because it's your, your partner's job to do it and you refuse to do it, you might wanna bag that or cut it, rake it up and use it as mulch. All right, so this might lead into browns. So collecting materials. You wanna choose a kitchen collection system. We, we touched on this a bit already. It can be anything. Um, there might be lots of yuck, but if you can manage your yuck factor, I think that works for you. Maybe you're dumping that pail every day. Maybe it's every two or three days. 
um, saving your newspaper, putting it at the bottom to absorb moisture and odors is really helpful. It can all just go in. And it doesn't have to be something fancy. You can have a couple ice cream pails in rotation or the containers Rodney showed, even like a mason jar. Maybe you live alone or there's just minimal people in the house or one of our volunteers in this picture, she just has a, um, an old plastic uh, bowl that she no longer uses for whatever. And it, it works perfect, still serves a purpose of holding materials. Um, you don't necessarily need a lid on that. Mine doesn't have a lid on it but the one at the lake does because there's more rodents and stuff out there and the dogs and stuff. So we put a lid on that one. So you don't need to cut up your scraps. It's not necessary. However, the smaller your stuff is, the quicker it'll break down. But like, don't sit there with a knife and, and chop and prepare things. Um, just try to break it up when you can. Or what I often do is I freeze a lot of my scraps and then I take them to the lake and use them in the garden there so it's like chopping at the cellular, cellular level. Um, so if you can, you can even store discards in a bin in the freezer. Maybe that, you have freezer room to do that. Uh, so brown, be a leaf thief, but ask permission. So if your neighbor kind of, you know, throwing out their leaves, hey, can I have your leaves? Check to see if there's dog poop in there or even do them a favor and rake it up for them because you get all that good leafy goodness after. Um, so if your neighbors don't compost, ask to take their leaves. Or you can use a lawnmower with a collection bag when the leaves are dry and it'll break them up and save you the work of raking. So you want to avoid large dense materials like sticks and branches. Those will take a long time to decompose. Uh, we've seen people use sticks and branches as mulch or I know Rodney collects popsicle sticks and stir sticks and he just cuts them up and uses them as mulch in his compost and works great. I love them. I love them. So all sorts of different uh, materials that one can add. You there's nothing wrong with having twigs, branches, and sticks in your compost pile. In fact, it might create little pockets of air to add to that aeration. But if you don't want to take sticks and twigs and branches out of your finished compost, then maybe try and keep them out from going in. Does that make sense? Don't put them in in the first place. Um, collecting materials is an interesting thing because, again, your method of collection reflects you. Um, some people, you know, I'm not too, uh, I don't sweat the small stuff in my collection material. So I'm okay with seeing the stuff in a transparent container. Whereas, you know, Cassidy is lovely and she's got a beautiful kitchen and she might have chosen a collection material, a collection bucket that perfectly matches her walls. Um, so you're also thinking not just about the science of the stuff in it, but what will fit in my lifestyle to keep me going for a while? There is one suggestion I will add, uh, share with folks. I do find that by layering just a little bit, like make it maybe a paper towel or a napkin, or even um, a piece of old newspaper at the bottom, I find that does help me get the stuff out when I go to my compost bin to dump it out. And it also soaps up some of that gooey goodness. Um, again, how often you put it, take out your compost materials um, and, uh, and what you do with them, how much you chop them will reflect your style. So I bet there's somebody on this call who likes to juice every once in a while. And after that juicy goodness, you're gonna have this pulpy stuff. Well, that, that is going to be really high on the water of greens, browns, water, air, but really low on the air. So every time you're adding this stuff, the smaller the bits, the less the air. So Chopping things up is really great to make it make those individual pieces available. But this, once it gets really chopped, like juicing, you're going to have to think about air. Always thinking about greens, browns, water, air. And I think going from there to there. And the same goes for freezing. When you, your stuff melts, it, it'll like be this, blah, it'll just be a, like a slop. Um, so I like to just dump a little bit and then add some browns and then I kind of just mix it up with a pitchfork and just call it a day because by that point my arms hurt. So <laughs> I have another method. We'll talk about that later as well. Um, all right. So going bagless. It is a funny video. And you know what makes it even funnier? Like the 13th time you've watched it, it's even better. And now I look forward to it. And uh, yeah, it's good. It's good. So leaving your clippings on the lawn, really helpful if you're kind of after this presentation, you're like, oh, home composting isn't still for me. Um, however, yeah, I can leave my clippings on the lawn. That helps a lot. Um, and really, 
you only have to do it like six ish months out of the year. So because the other months we have lots of snow. So uh, Rodney, did that answer the question about browns yet? It's really funny Tamara. I was mentioning browns. So um, there are a whole range of browns that people can add. And uh, obviously autumn leaves in our climate is a great example of that. And uh, for those of you that are interested in doing autumn leaves, those dry leaves, get them while they're hot um, or get them while they're a commodity. So from a, even late August all the way to uh, November, there are autumn leaves to be found. And I have uh, yet to find a person who will not offer me their leaves when I see that they've got bags of leaves set out but I'm not actually telling you to steal leaves. Um, in addition, um, if it, I do find that in spring, somewhere around April, there's actually a flush of autumn leaves once again. So if you miss your, your supply in fall, there's always a spring supply as well. In addition, um, there's lots of other kinds of browns. So you're looking for all sorts of plant material that has dried out. So, it's left with a high carbon uh, content compared to its nitrogen content, and it's usually dry. So let's see, um, you could get hay. Um, some people say they have like a hamster at home and they've got that uh, wood chip bedding, that's another thing. Um, shredded newspaper, uh, I mean news, news, newspaper, not the magazine stuff, but newspaper. Um, I use napkins, um, I've used paper towels. Um, Gosh, yes, sawdust, but again, that's a good example where sawdust or wood chips, you want to be thoughtful about it. How are you going to mix it in so that it's not just one big mess, so balance. And also um, mixing it in so that uh, it will actually break down. You could do some twigs, I mean, if you want to. It's not all gonna break down right away. Um, cardboard, I've heard people tearing up cardboard as well, like pizza boxes. Um, I, I mentioned that I've, I've used Q-tips. So one can keep an eye out for all sorts of browns that we have in our lifestyle. Um, again, it has to be things that you're comfortable with. So pick and choose the items that uh, folks are comfortable with. Tamara, do you have anything else to add to that? Did I miss anything? Maybe some water and some air. All right, greens, browns, water, air. Um, so the rule of thumb is, you, your compost pile should be about as moist as a wrung out sponge. There's your guideline. Everything about your compost pile or my compost pile is about creating an environment where the microorganisms, the biodiversity, the life is going to do the breakdown. And that's the crucial thing. So pretty much no life ha happens on, on our planet without water. And then that's where the air comes in because it really creates that excellent environment for a plethora of biodiversity. So you've got the fungi, you've got the microorganisms, you've got the bacteria, you've got the macroorganisms like uh, maybe worms or centipedes, um, all of which are creating this really, uh, this ecosystem that is going to break down the, the browns and the greens quite fast. So that's what we're controlling is this, uh, uh, ecosystem. Um, so, which relates to uh, Namitha's question about how often you need to add water or air. Here's where your own experience is crucial. It's always a balance and it's never going to be constant. So Tamara mentioned carbon to nitrogen ratio at one point and you could get into that. You and I can totally get into carbon to nitrogen ratio, but that's always changing. It's dynamic. So at one point in time, the carbon to nitrogen ratio in this bin with these inputs might be X, but an hour later or a day later, that's going to change because air is going to be, the oxygen is going to be leaving, it's going to be transferring, the water might be percolating, but also um, the nitrogen carbon ratio is changing between those. So you're always going to have to, when you fluff about once a week, you're going to look for that, um, what's the air smelled like now? Do I need to fluff a little bit more? Or is it looking moist? Is it looking drier or too moist? Um, uh, so uh, more moist than a wrung out sponge or too dry and therefore I need to add water. And that's where your sense of that balance is important. 
I think I've overdone that, Tamara. No, that's perfect. You always explain things better, a good balance between me maybe not knowing as much as Mark, you knowing just as much as Mark, but making it so people can understand the science plus the practice, like the practical version of it. I'm going to step in once again, Tamara, and actually highlight this. So um, in Mark's little video, which I recommend we take a look at that ba basics, we've got, remember, greens, browns, water, and air. And on this side is your greens and your water. Greens and water are both moist. The greens are high in nitrogen. So if the, the compost pile is not moist enough, you've either got to add more greens or add more water because the greens themselves will have moisture in them. My banana peel, maybe the top of my um, green pepper, that's got moisture in it. And as it breaks down, it's going to bring some water and also nutrients. So if it's, uh, if it's um, going too slow, this is the area where I'm going to add. If the compost pile is not composting enough, I want to add water or I want to add greens. If the compost pile is smelly or it's going too fast, this is the side of the square where I want to concentrate. I want to add more browns to balance out the greens, or I want to add more air to balance out the water. And that's why this greens, browns, water, and air ratio is always working in hand. These are the materials that are breaking down, and these are the two factors that I control. And I think that takes us over to methods of composting. It, this is just the basic formula, but there's a whole a bunch of different ways to balance these things. And you can balance these things in these types of systems, which we've already talked about. Um, again, one compost bin. You've only seen one compost bin or pile. Maintaining your bin. So just going over what Ronnie had said, fluffing once a week is probably good enough, but maybe you've made chicken noodle soup and you've made apple pie and you've made a stew and cut up a whole bunch of other carrots and celery and stuff for lunches. You might have a lot of greens that week. So you might need to fluff it twice that week and add more browns. So just adjust to what your usage would be. So compost should be ready within three to six months. It just depends on how hot it gets and how much you put in there and the balance. So finished compost will collect at the bottom of the pile. So these kind of bins, they're great because it'll just kind of settle at the bottom. Um, unfinished compost is biologically active. Adding it to soil upsets the nutritional and biological balance, but it's only a concern around rapidly growing plants. So you don't want to take half done compost and chuck it on your squash plants. Um, a way to check this is, let's say now it's October and you're kind of like, I think I have finished compost. Um, take a handful and it's gonna feel moist, put it in a sealed bag and leave it in overnight. If the bag puffs up, the compost is not ready yet. If the bag doesn't puff up, give it a sniff. Finished compost will still smell earthy, not sour or wrong. So I'm going to, uh, these are some points I'm gonna to send to Cassidy as well. Um, yeah, so that it sticks with you. So you wanna spread compost in fall and it really doesn't matter if it's finished. So, my method, we have a bin, we fill the bin, and then come October, after we're putting our garden back in our garden, we literally put our plants through a wood chipper and just put it back in the garden. We dig a bunch of holes, we just put our unfinished compost in, entrench it, and it just kind of takes care of itself. Or you have half-finished compost, you can just put it on top of the garden, add some browns, you're good to go, or even, it doesn't have to be a garden, your bedding plants, your potted plants, your um, container gardens. It doesn't have to be like a physical garden in a yard kind of thing, because not everybody has that. So using compost, spread mostly finished compost in your garden in the fall so it can cure over winter. So then you don't have to worry about the plastic bag test. Um, flush, fluff finished compost into the topsoil and you want to double dig coarse browns into clay areas. Um, so you don't also don't want to use too much compost. It can upset the abil ability of the soil to release nutrients. So again, a balance. You want your soil, you want your compost, 
and then you put it together and it'll create something. So if your year yields drop, it may be that there was too much compost had been used for many years. So example, last year, we put a lot of compost where our potatoes were, um, unfinished compost, and our potatoes did not do well. There's just too much of one thing. Um, but we also, I also learned you need to use other materials for that too. Um, so crop rotation netting autumn leaves will also help. So not planting your things in the same area, but this is again, another workshop on gardening. Um, another really easy thing you could do is compost tea. You could take your finished compost, put it in a, um, a coffee filter, kind of like a tea bag, tie it up, um, kind of steep it in warm water or rainwater. Um, the liquid that gathers at the bottom of something is the juice, which over time will putrefy and become leachate. Um, and with the, the compost tea, you can just water your plants over top of it. I suggest not over top of the green part. You could burn them if your compost tea is too strong. But again, just experiment. Try it out. Um, it's a really easy way to use compost, especially with house plants. You may not want to put, um, maybe if you're not sure if your compost is finished, make a compost tea and put it on your house plants. Um, so you can sprinkle finished compost in trenches or holes when planting seeds um, before you cover with soil. And you put around a base of plants in your garden or on top of potted plants. So troubleshooting. So before you proceed, always ask questions. Um, before you give up, ask us questions. Composting can be fun and easy. Finding the right method that works best for you, just because your neighbor's doing it one way or because I throw everything in a trench, so it doesn't mean you need to do it that way, or because my parents meticulously label, layer greens and browns and water and they just do it so perfect. Um, you don't have to do it that way. Find something that works for you and your lifestyle so it can be sustainable. So you can also uh, visit a few compost bins at Compost School. It is an interpretive site. So it's right next to John Jansen Nature Center. And you can go there. I don't, it's not staffed anymore on weekends, right, Rodney? So there's no more staffed on weekends. It normally is for the summer. The summer obviously was a little bit odd. You might catch one of us there watering plants, likely Mark. Um, he can ask, answer some socially distant questions or questions from a distance. Um, but you can also just go there and, and look at all the bins that are there. Um, there's signage as well, so you can learn things from there as well. And you can learn the most from disasters. So make a mistake. What is that that um, Miss Frizzle says on Magic School Bus? It's like, get messy, make mistakes, and something. It's a good motto. I should really look for that video. Not that I'm having luck playing videos, but what you can learn from those mistakes. And just start. Just start. So if you're kind of like, well, how do I start? We talked about everything about how do I just start? Get a bin. Or if you have the room, have a pile. Throw some browns down. Throw some greens down. Give it some water and just see how it goes. And vermicomposting is in a whole separate workshop as well, but we do have information on that outline as well. And you could get worms from compost school. There's a self um, help yourself um, area that Mark sometimes puts paper bags with some worm composting things and you can take some worms in a, in a container um, as well. So Tamara, um, we, I, I want to reiterate for everyone on the, on the session, that if you are composting at home, great, keep doing it. Whatever you're doing, you're doing great, as long as you've got greens, browns, water, and air. Um, but I also promise you, you're going to have a problem at some point. And if you do, ask for help. So again, we've, uh, Cassidy's gonna follow up with uh, contact information on how to find, inf uh, find out more, but edmonton.ca slash compost is our website. You can email compost at edmonton.ca or the phone number is 780-496-5526. Now that is just doing my job. I will mention that um, I bet everyone in this call, I bet we all do a good job at keeping our kitchens clean. Like a, a kitchen's a place to be clean and hygienic and, you know, maintain safety. Your compost bin is kind of the opposite. 
let it be messy. That's where you're growing stuff. You're intentionally growing stuff. So let it be messy. And that relates to, um, gosh, I think it was Julia who asked about um, mold. Is it okay to put mold in? Well, again, the things that are going to do the breaking down inside the compost pile are, um, you know, bacteria, other microorganisms, actinomycetes, macroorganisms, and yes, you guessed it, mold and fungi. So if you're comfortable put a, putting a piece of moldy bread in, by all means, you're feeding life into that pile and congratulations, you've made, you've created an environment for life, um, for biodiversity. <laughs> that being said, you gotta gauge what's comfortable for you. So somebody had said, oh gosh, where's the person? Cassidy, who had asked about uh, uh, fruit flies? Somebody had asked, what am I doing wrong? I've got fruit flies. Oh, you're doing great. You've created an environment for life. That's great. It's part of that biodiversity. Again, the fruit flies, you know, they've got a lifespan that's very short. So if you can stomach it for a little while, do what you can to, to, to keep that environment going. But what could you do? What could you put on top to smother their eggs? Well, that in my case, I keep some leaves around and I just cover that with, uh, with some leaves and then the fruit flies can't get out and their eggs are kind of trapped or maybe it's a little bit too wet. So then I could add some browns or I could make an environment for more air. Um, Tamara, we also had, Brad had a great question here. It's not scientific at all. He was asking about pH in different compost. Do you want to answer that? If this seems like Rodney? I'm putting her on the spot, I am. Yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> pH. Roddy, very good question. I'm so glad that you brought this question forward. I can't answer it. Um, can you answer about pH? Should it be pH neutral? It's, it's always going to be a little bit, uh, if my understanding is correct, it's going to be a little bit acidic. But um, to Brad's question, hey, uh, Brad, it's a fair question, and no two um, uh, versions of finished compost are going to be exactly the same because they've got different ingredients. Yes, um, my home compost, my finished compost from my home compost pile is going to have a distinctly different mix of um, not just pH, but the overall nutrients that I'm going to get out of my pile compared to the manure. Uh, and again, you referenced, uh, Brad mentioned pig manure, so that's going to be different than, say, something that's gone through the gut of a cow with uh, you know, multiple stomachs. Um, there is definitely a line of thought that, um, re let's recall that all of this is towards feeding soil and building soil. The texture of your soil is made up of three things, silt, sand, and clay but that's just texture. I didn't mention anything about carbon. I didn't mention about the roots and the roots taking um, photosynthesis and the, the, the nutrients of photosynthesis into the soil. And I certainly didn't mention the variety of life. So it, it, the, there's a big line of thinking that, hey, if you've got the opportunity, mixing different types of uh, compost so that you get different types of um, uh, biodiversity in your soil. If you've got the opportunity, you've got the will and the motivation, there's nothing wrong with mixing both. Um, but you are going to get a, uh, get a different uh, pH balance. And I can't, like, it, it, one cannot assume that um, all home compost, finished home compost is roughly the same pH level. But this also goes to the realm that Tamara had mentioned. There's different types of home compost. So sometimes I make home compost that's made strictly from leaves, or it could make it strictly from leaves and grass. So I'm gonna get a different product out of that. So as one's thinking about the greens, the browns, the water and the air, you have to think about, well, I'm going to get the product out from the product that I put in. So one thinks about, watch what you're putting in because it's a reflection of you. Um, what do you do if there are slugs in your compost? Well, very topical for this year. Oh yes, oh yes, how about that? Um, so that's often a reflection of moisture. So one can balance moisture. What does one balance moisture with, Cassidy? Oh, I know the answer to this one. Browns. Or? Or uh, air. Hey, there you go. So you're always thinking about how can I bring in more air or uh, use the browns to soak up the moisture. Um, so that's one thing. Um, hey, 
the only reason that I ever get critters in my home compost pile is uh, because the, I put my compost pile in the outdoors, which is their home, not my home. So there's a degree of tolerance here. Um, there's that too. Um, there are, of course, I bet if I put it out there, hey, could somebody post on the chat if they have a trick about uh, collecting and killing slugs? I bet we'll get some great suggestions on there. Um, Tamara? I was gonna, I can't find my chat button because I'm in a different present button and I'll just close it all. But my mom used to take like grapefruit halves and like put them in the garden and the slugs would go under there. I don't know if that's a myth. I was wondering if, yeah, if that was something people. I bet if I put it out to the group, has anybody uh, collected slugs with beer? Oh, there we go. I knew we'd get there we go. Uh, Namitha to mention dried flour, yeast, sugar, and water. Hey, that sounds like a version of, uh, I'm not a, anyways, dried flour and yeast. That sounds like very close to beer as far as I'm concerned. Yes, beer, beer totally there we go, works. Roxanne, thank you. Salt. Again, my caution about salt is you, I have heard people put salt in their compost. Guess what you're going to be putting into your garden and on your soil? So let's be thoughtful, oh. garbage in, comp uh, garbage in, garbage out. You put bad stuff into your compost, you're being, putting bad stuff into your soil. So let's be thoughtful about that. I have a question. Oh, sorry. I was going to say, I have a question that came up earlier that I tried to answer, and I don't know if I answered correctly, um, around tea. So I think I answered correctly from what I've learned is that tea, if dried, would be a brown, and the tea leaves, if wet, would be a green still? I think it would always be a green because it's a plant. Um, so even like tea in a tea bag, you can put the tea bag in there too. Even the one staple in it is okay, but it would still be a green because it, it would always be a plant or a fruit, even though it was dried. Even coffee grounds are actually a green because they're okay. high in nitrogen. So See, just because, well, yeah, but, and that's like a confusing thing too. We're like, well, coffee's brown. Would it not be a brown? I think coffee turns into a brown once it's been made and it's wet and then it dries and it sits for a long time, then it would become a brown. Um, well, I think that was the, the question though, is like we're thinking like tea that's been brewed and then it sits forever and it dries out. I would call that a brown as well. Okay. There's, there's no hard and fast about this, but one is thinking about this balance of greens and browns that we're putting into our compost pile. So here's my I, I choose to collect my coffee grounds separately and as they sit here for a very long time and they dry out, that's browns. But right after they're brewed and all of that watery, coffee deliciousness, yeah, it's going to be more available nitrogen uh, relative to, you know, week old coffee grounds. Um, and, and then Brad said, Brad was saying that this is also good stuff to put around garden plants to uh, discourage slugs. By the way, thanks for it. And I was just going to say that it totally depends on if you're collecting all your coffee in one container like Rodney with the intent to use as browns or you just want to dispose of it quickly and then it would be a green like tea. Um, but even then, if you're, if you're thinking, I need to put more browns in my compost, oh, I've had this tea sitting for a while and it's like this much tea, it's not going to make a difference. Just just put it in. Unless you're collecting it like Roddy and you have a lot of it, um, then it would be more, but. I guess it depends on your tea drinking habits is what I, I think it comes down to. <laughs> yeah, or where you're putting your tea after. Like if you're just, oh yeah, that's true. Yeah. Oh, I should have So Roxanne, we've got like anyway. two minutes. Can I ask a quiz question for the group? I'm going to take that as a yes. Okay, I'm going to ask this quick quiz question. See if somebody can post on the chat. So if I open my compost pile and it's smelling like really like that, that uh, whiff of not yucky, yuckness smell, um, what could I do with my greens, greens, browns, water, and air? What could I do in order to decrease that smelly stinkiness? Thank you, Namitha. I would add browns or, where's my browns? Right up here. Or, ah, uh, thank you, Carly. I could fluff it a little bit to add some oxygen, let off that, uh, that ammonia smell. 
Okay, so if my compost is going, is just taking forever and I want to speed it up a little bit, what could I do? I think Donna, Donna mentioned fork it in at, at air. Well, uh, kind of, yeah, but um, Namatha mentioned I could add some greens to really speed things up. Or Namatha also, uh, Roxanne mentioned, add some waters or some water some, or some greens. Excellent. So we've got those basics. And if I had a problem, where could I go to answer my questions or learn a little bit more? Thank you very much, Namatha. I could go to, one could go to Compost School. Compost School has a Facebook page. We've also got a website. Tamara, I'm going to turn it over to you. Sure, and I just, that was such a nice segue. For more information, you can reach us at all those places. Um, Mark answers the compost hotline. Um, generally, Monday to Friday, let's say 8 to 4-ish. But Mark just loves his job so much that you might even catch him on a weekend <laughs> answering his phone. But um, he's so passionate about it, so happy to help that he, he wants to make that work for you. And quite often he'll say, come down to Compo School if, if, if they're open, um, meaning we have staff, bring a sample of your compost and he can help troubleshoot that with you as well. Um, even if you email compost.edmonton.ca, any one of us can answer a question. Or sometimes we have MCR volunteers, master composter recyclers, and they're happy to be a compost troubleshooter. Um, it's hard for us to get them to go to people's houses, um, given the times. However, um, they're happy to do virtual things, uh, community garden things, and you would just reach out to us, which could be mcrp at edmonton.ca. Or you can even do the compost at edmonton.ca and Mark will send it to us. Um, so promise us that when you start and probably when you get frustrated or if you get frustrated, please don't give up without giving us a call or reaching out. Uh, we want to make this work for you because there's so many benefits and it's something that you can easily do at home. Or even in, in, if you live in an apartment, vermicomposting with worms, 